Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are around the world, from the mountains to the prairies, from the sea to the shining sea, and wherever in between. Hello to all who have joined us today. My name is Jeff Bartow, and I am a trust strategist here at Symantec. Joining us on this, this webinar hosted by SiteTuners, I want to say thank you for taking your time in your day and joining your colleagues in participating in our presentation today. Again, my name is Jeff Barto. I work at Symantec, and we are the first original and leading SSL certification authority. More about what that means later. Um, it is our duty to help you put security first and keeping you up to speed on what's new and now in security and trust. I am passionate about driving and inspiring fundamental trust on a very public internet. I believe we are all in this together. And that's going to fuel a lot of what we're, I'm going to be covering today and what my counterpart, Tim Ash, will be covering later in the presentation. Now, I do have a co-presenter, and Tim will be speaking later because it's important to experience multiple points of view and communication styles. Tim will be speaking up later, and you'll know when that happens. I'll make that crystal clear. But I think it's important to start with a little housekeeping. So first things first, before we begin, for the best viewing experience, make sure you turn off pop-up blockers and email notifications and instant messages, anything that's going to get in the way of you having a quality video experience here. Make sure your system sound is turned up or put on a pair of headset, a headphones or a headset. Um, if possible, view this presentation on a PC or a Mac instead of a mobile device. You'll get a better quality. Of course, we always recommend that you switch from a Wi-Fi connection to a wired connection. Um, there are some uh, common questions that come up, so let me answer the top two right away. First, yes, we are recording this presentation, and yes, you can get a copy of the slide deck and the link to the recording after pre today's presentation. So if you have colleagues who are missing out, or someone who you realize after it's all done, oh, they should have heard this, they'll have that opportunity and we'll share the content uh, as well as that link for you. Okay. A couple more things, and then we'll get going on the content here. Uh, uh, first, there is a hashtag for this event, and that is the virtual handshake. So I welcome all of you that are watching right now, or if you have some insight, insight that prompts. We got a little feedback on the line there. Apologies for the sound quality. Uh, there we go. Uh, if you uh, catch something in the presentation that you would like up-leveled, please do uh, tweet that out using the hashtag pound the virtual handshake. If I could ask any other presenters or panelists on the line, if you could please mute. There we go. We got rid of that feedback. And speaking of feedback, uh, the thing that I'd like to promote here is that, yes, we will be taking questions and vetting out some answers live. That will be towards the end of the presentation. Tim will be handling that. So. Let's get started. Okay, you're probably wondering what on earth the, a security company is doing on a conversion webinar and talking about this. And really the answer lies here in two spaces. First of all, it's in that image on the right, that circle check mark that everybody knows means trust. This is the right place. This is the correct site. It's a mark of authenticity uh, on World, on websites worldwide. That circle check mark that we inherited from our, our VeriSign informa uh, incarnation uh, is now paid forward in the semantic brand and the Norton brand to which it's associated. So knowing and understanding the, the role of security and trust on desktops worldwide, but also on the sites that are authenticated to be for real, these are the, right, the real sites and the sites you know to trust. The second reason why, why we're involved here is because we are e-commerce engine ourselves. We're very concerned about, about conversions and, and, and trackable ROI from our e-commerce engine. That's what, part of what we do here is we run our own business online here um, in selling the products that, that we represent. So not only are we a vendor here, but we're also one of you. That's it. Let's move forward. And that's getting into the content here. So way back in, in the beginning of, of the World Wide Web phenomenon, when things were really hitting, this cartoon ran in the New Yorker. Everybody thought of the time, everybody kind of got it, that you could be completely anonymous 
on the internet. You could be whoever you want. If you're a dog, nobody knows you're a dog. Everybody got a good chuckle out of that because you could pose and be whoever you want. Obviously, with the advent of social media and other things that were originally called Web 2.0, that's completely changed. You are more exposed than ever. You, your identity, your information, what you want to share, even sometimes whether you share it or not, is exposed to others. And the, the, the equation is actually flipped. It's the sites that you go to, the places on the internet, that can pose to be something who they're really not. So it's interesting how, how over time, the need for authentication and the, need and the ability to hide that has completely flip-flopped from originally back and from the users being whoever they want and claiming whoever they want and hiding if they want to, not participating, to now everybody's included and it's the sites that can choose to show who they are or are not. So this need for authentication has always been there, but it's more prominent these days in authenticating who you are and validating to your customers that you're on the right place. And this is so much, so much more important in an e-commerce or an e-tail context or a place where you're trying to drive conversions on your site. So let's talk a little more about that. The way I want to introduce this is through a property called the transitive property of trust. Now, it's a lot of big words, but before we even get there, let's talk about the basis of it, which is something we all learned back in probably high school, which is the transitive property of equality. And I'll bet you, like me, didn't realize that's the actual name for this thing where if A equals B and B equals C, then therefore A equals C. We all know that, but the name of that actually is the transitive property of equality. There's a version of this that goes alongside with trust and driving trust on the internet. And it works like this. The transitive property of trust is that the customer who trusts your site is the customer who stays on your site. And when a customer tends to stay on your site, they're doing things on your site. They're interacting with your site. When they do that, they click connect and continue and and log in and confirm and enroll and create and purchase and complete all these things that you want them to do as a website operator, but also things that you can go and track. You can show metrics. You can show improvement that you're making a difference, and these lead towards benef business benefit, which is the next step. When they do these things, there's some degree of business uplift, or the customers are demonstrating loyalty, or if you're really lucky, both. And when they do that, that is good for business. And therefore, using a transitive property, the customer who trusts your site is good for business. So it's important to understand how to do trust right and how trust can be done wrong and things that work against trust. So I'm going to go into that a bit here, and let me do so. First of all, by means of example, let's talk about our friends at Google. Okay, Google has their number one outward-facing product that is to end consumers, and that is search. To all of us on the business end, it's search marketing and all that, and what do we get out of search, and what do we learn from search, and how can we get our search rankings up, and how do we market to people in search, and so on and so forth. But looking at it from the user standpoint, the people who pay the bills for all of us, Google gets this idea of how they can deploy trust in the space, and they took a product that, that my organization sells, SSL certificates, and they applied protected search. They applied those certificates to the, their, their number one user product, which is Google Search itself. Okay. There's some things that happened as a result of, result of this. First of all, it drove search marketers crazy because suddenly protected search results became the number one search result. We couldn't tell what people are searching for. On the other hand, it was a big gamble for Google because Google saw the idea that if they protect what people are searching for, then they benefit from that because the users have a heightened sense of trust in their experience with Google and therefore the results, results that they're served. So even though protecting search and hiding those search queries from marketers and Google's own, own people paying Google's bills um, creates one problem, Google made a bet and is winning that bet that protecting that 
and reaping the benefit of that tr more trusted user experience will pay off for Google and its customers, us, in the longer, longer term, rather than showing the search results as itself from, from unprotected search. It was an interesting gamble. In fact, Firefox then went and doubled down and they said every time you go to a Google search in our browser, in our Firefox browser, Mozilla protects always defaults to, to using SSL, always defaults to, to protected search. So they got the idea too, and it's really interesting uh, the payoff that, that, that's resulted in the gamble that they, that they took. But they really buy this idea that this is very much about the users. Get the users to trust the site and more magic will happen. Okay, let's show you how that, that's played out in other contexts too. The next one is taking it to another user-oriented step, again focusing on the user experience here, and looking at something that's called Always On SSL. Of course, I work at an SSL company, so we, you know, of course I'm, I'm going to talk about these things, but the point being increasing the trust experience. Leading social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, as well as leading financial sites. Okay, you see them displayed at the bottom here finance, insurance, banking, what have you, all saw the idea of the transitive property of trust and said, wait a minute, we get this, this thing where if we can protect, just the way Google did with search, if we can protect the whole experience that a user has with our site from mo the moment they arrive until the moment they leave or the moment they log in, log on until the moment they log off, there will be higher business results and trackable rewards from creating that trust, trusted experience. And you'll see this, this implementation, it's called Always On SSL, across these sites that I've noticed here, that, I, that I've listed here, but also those that I, I've pictured, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Protecting that user experience because even though it may cause some, some operational issues, as we've seen in the news with Facebook, rolling out this always on, always protected uh, environment, the benefit to the users is a more trusted experience. They now trust the site and know that it's not a dog, going back to that original cartoon. So there's a sense of cross-validation. The site knows it's really that user, but on the, on the site side, or on the customer side, I know it's really the site, and I have, a, I have in this protected space, we know that good things happen. Okay? When a customer trusts the site, there is trackable ROI that goes along with that. You know, I trust this site uplifts the measurable, we've measured between 11 and 30, 36%, depending on what you're tracking, whether it's abandoned shopping carts, more eyeballs on search results, what have you, strictly from the trust component. And that's great uplift that you can add into a dimension of driving traffic to your site in conversions upon your site. The reason why this is so important, obvious, you know, from what I've stated, and you can come to our the semantic site, by the way, and get, get case studies that bear this out and customers, real customers talking about real advantages of trust on their site. But let's look at what happens when someone taking, for example, in an e-commerce context, what are the reasons why someone would bail out of the online purchase process? And by the online purchase process here for this e-commerce context, I'm talking a lot about the, the whole scope of it. That's before they get to their site, when they're trying to find your site, your product, your brand, your offering, your service. Two, when they complete exchange product of goods and services and, and for money and what have you at the very end of it. Very wide definition here. And what are the re reasons why someone may pull the ripcord and bail out of that process? Okay. There's some typical things you might expect, number one and number two on the list. I didn't understand the delivery costs, and there wasn't enough information about the product. Okay. By the way, these are worldwide stats. This isn't just US. This is um, driven by the e-consultancy organization in the UK. Um, number three on the list is they don't trust the website or they have security concerns. And it's really interesting there how tied trust is to security. Am I safe here? Or am I not? Our friends at Google also let us in, let us in on something else. Not only that they're, that they're doing this trusted search thing, but users on, in a desktop browser especially are using tabbed browsing to their benefit. Okay, users 
already have four windows open when they're comparing products or services or brands or things that they're interested in buying. That is, your brand and your competitors. They're open in different tabs. So when customers come to, they come to be one of these 50%, they sniff something's wrong with the website and decide to close and go somewhere else, they're not closing the browser experience or going starting over from scratch. They've already got the windows, according to Google, already got your compet competitor's windows open. And it's, it's a simple act of closing your tab and you're out of the running and the customer is already in process with your competition. So the stakes are so high here. First of all, to avoid being providing one of the reasons behind this 50%, and to get the users not to close your tab, because we already know they're already shopping at your competitor's place and they're ready to give someone else their business. They may blow it too. They may do things that, in, on the other hand, increase trust. So let's understand what those things are. Tim will come along here in a, in a bit and talk a lot about all the things that you can do to promote trust. But I want to show a few things about how things, are, how things can go wrong. Okay? But in doing so, let's peek down the, so to, the, the funnel, so to speak, of getting someone to that moment of truth where there's an exchange of money for goods and services or exchange of information for, for, for like information or service on, on your site. Okay? And looking at the components of searching for your offering and then landing on your site and then interacting your site and getting to purchase or that moment of truth. Okay? And in this visual, we're looking down the funnel. This isn't a bullseye here. We're picture that this is a funnel and the outer ring is the widest part of it and it narrows. You're narrowing users, but you want that bottom of that funnel to be as, as wide as possible. And there's all sorts of things that could go wrong in the experience, like before the customer even gets to your site. If there's a lack of trust in the search results, they may never get to your site. Or if they get there, any whiff that the customer gets that their site is not trustworthy or isn't who they expected it to be. Customers are now looking for these things. We've now seen from enough phishing sites what goes wrong. I'll point out a few of them in a minute. But those can send a customer going to one of those other tabs and away from your site. Finally, when they get, let's say they get through the purchase process or the enrollment process, whatever you want them to do, want them to do, but you get to that moment of truth when they the transaction is going to happen or not, and they can say yes. If you haven't given them all the requisite warm fuzzies leading up to that, well, that could drive abandonment at the worst possible time, and that is in the shopping cart or whatever analogous of the situation you have on your site, that moment of truth. There's all sorts of things further up the funnel, outward in the funnel, that can reduce the amount of convertible visitors to your website. So what I want to focus on now is let's identify what some of those things are. And this is a great opportunity to either take notes or remember, get the presentation for from us at the end of at the end of the show. Okay, let's talk about those. Okay, the top ten ways to lose a customer's trust. What's interesting here and what I want you to focus on is this is before they even get to your site. Okay, they're not on your site yet. So that 50% the contributor is towards that Bad news in traditional media, social media, okay, for our product, like the certificate expired, or you're getting something that reflects badly on your site, maybe in the terms of trust or in terms of security. I've shown some of those screenshots here from search engine land, land uh, online, or the register, you know, a big publica publication in the IT space, or in social media, getting a tweet about, uh-oh, this site is untrusted. That's not good for a major brand. Okay, really getting your arms around that. Obviously, there's some news you can control and some you can't, but don't forget that there's multiple places that a customer gets that information before they even get to your site. When they go to find your site, obviously we're talking about search. So getting a good showing in search results is great, but getting a poor showing is a completely different thing, and you have to consider both. Okay, and by Poor showing, I don't mean the number, you know, whether you're number 85 or 86 or 1 or 2 or you show up on the first page or not. What I'm referring to here is what do your search results actually say or display about your company, about you, your brand, your image? How are you going to affect the customer before you even get there and paying attention to that? What are the things that you can do in those few words, but are, are there other things that you may be able to do 
in displaying that your site is trustworthy. Okay, moving on from there. Search engines are all wound up about not sending people to the wrong, wrong site, to bad sites, to malware sites, to infectious sites, to, to, to cracked and hacked sites. Browsers are protecting against this too. So you've got a double layer of defense on the user's behalf that may work against you. So if you're suspect, your site is suspected for having malware, again, look at the word here, that you are suspected or it is suspicious that you have malware or a phishing, or, or a, you're a phishing site. Not that you are, but you are suspected. That is proven guilty or assumed guilty before proven innocent. Okay? That can work against you. The customer is not even on your site. So you want to you pay attention to the kinds of things that keep you out of the crosshairs of the search engines and the browsers that say, this may be a phishing or a malware site. I've got a screenshot of that at the, the, the bottom left hand of the corner of what that looks like. And the options there for the users are frightening. Okay? This site, some scary number, not the name of your site, has been suspected as a phishing site. Look at the options that the user has. Go back, learn more, report an error, or the very last one, after they've pointed out that you understand the risks, you may proceed. Yikes. The browsers and the search engines are doing everything they can to keep people away from sites. But sometimes it may be the case that they overdid it, and you made a mistake which plopped you, your site into this category. So you want to look for those. We'll talk about those in a minute. In fact, it's that minute, so let's go there. Okay, top 10 ways. These are the ones, the, the next five, that they're on, once they're on your site. The user's on your site, if they're within the funnel, they're further along, they get some sort of security warning. You've seen them. I don't know about this security certificate, or I can't verify the identity of these sites. I've got screenshots of it, so you know what the user is faced with. Okay, these are things that you can't message against on your site. The browser is doing it, but you have direct control over these things by getting your arms around how you deploy trust in your site. We know from research that I believe it is just a shade under 70% of users who get one of these warnings are going to close that tab. They're out of there. They are not going to stay with your site. Even though they landed on your site, even though you may have the product, the price, whatever that they're looking for at the moment, that you may have the greatest experience in design. If users see this, about 30% of them will continue. The rest of them are gone. And according to Google, they're already on your competitors' sites. You've lost that business. So getting your arms around this is crucial. Obviously, there's things that we, in pushing pages and, and, and experiences live, that we goof up, misspellings and dumb things like poor punctuation. Okay. I wrote this number seven like this on purpose because stuff just slips through. And we've all got to be better about QA and making sure we're staging things properly and catching as much as we can. Because not only does it look bad when we do this, just kind of it's not the best foot forward. These are the kinds of things that the browsers and, and, and the search engines are looking for. These are the cues that this is not the legitimate site. This is a bad place. This is the wrong place. This is malware. This is phishing. Because our competition, so to speak, in among the bad guys, the malwares, the fish vendors, the fishers, all that kind of stuff, who are trying to steal information, find ways in, do stuff, wreck sites, trade in information, all that kind of stuff, they're pushing sites lives as fast as possible, and there is no QA process. So these kind of things, these misspellings and dumb things like poor pop punctuation pop up left and right and customers tend to look for that that's their trigger of if the browser if the, the browser or the search engine hasn't found it they know to look for these things so what happens if you make that mistake and put something misspelled or mispunctuated on your site you now look like the bad guys so we don't want to go there okay let's bring it home on this slide and that is the mixed content warning again something that you probably won't see in pushing your site live but users may see this is, again, looking at the SSL product that we have, where you protect some of the content on a page, but you don't protect others. Okay, you've got multiple feeds of information being pulled from different servers or different locations, and all being put into a rich user experience, which you've designed and customers love, 
some is protected and some isn't. And the browser will automatically spring a warning up that says, mixed content or security warning. Do you want to view the web page content that was delivered securely? Which one do you, what, what do you want to do? OK, I work in this industry, and I don't even know the right choice here. Do I go with a whole secure experience, which means I'm missing out on part of the content? Or do I get all the content, but it doesn't mean I'm, I have a secure experience? I know what this means. But even I have a trouble with trouble making the choice. Imagine the end user who's not one of us. They're not one of the ones who make that value choice. All they do is they see an error message. And they become part of that 70% who say, I'm out of here. I'm closing your tab and going to one of the other three that I already have open. They become the reason for that 50% who abandon that say it's trust or security simply because you're mixing content and didn't realize it. So getting out your arms around what you protect, what you don't, what the whole user experience becomes very critical. Okay, I said top 10 ways to lose a customer's trust once they're on your site, once before they get to your site. Let's go to number nine and number 10. Number nine is about you. You didn't show them why they're safe. You didn't take the opportunity to display to them why they're safe. Number 10 is pretty similar. You didn't tell them, you didn't explain to them why they're safe. Okay? We can talk about multiple aspects here, that they're safe, or that you didn't show and tell them. But the thing that I really want to hit there is you. This is you. This is your opportunity to get rid of mistrust, fear, uncertainty, doubt. Get rid of all the rest of that top 10 list. And instead, move towards those things that are fundamental to driving trust on your site. OK, so you're probably run, wondering at this point, what are those things? You know, how, do I get, how do I get the payoff here? And I'm going to make a couple invitations by virtue of segue here. First of all, how do I deploy trust? How do I exude trust on my site? How do I defend against fear and doubt and uncertainty? How do I prevent causing my customers to abandon my site? Okay? It's high time to discover those things and, and, and to talk about those things before we get into that. I invite you to jot down the information here from Semantic and from Site Tuners. Okay, we've got some contact information by virtue of, of websites, as well as phone numbers. There's even an email address for Site Tuners. Either jot this down right now or capture a screenshot. For those of you on Windows, it's Alt Print Screen. For those of you on a Mac, it's Command Shift 3. You can capture this screen in case you got to bail out of this or you just want it right now. You like me too. Your your handwriting is illegible. You can capture this right now and know where to go and what to do to have a further conversation about these concepts. But I think it's high time to start discovering and to up-level. Now that we know what can go wrong, what can go right? What are those pillars of trust that you can pay attention to and be guided by in creating that optimum web experience that leads to more conversions and a wider base of the funnel? And for that, I want to, I want to welcome uh, my co-host and co-presenter, Tim Ash onto the scene. Tim is the CEO and founder of Site Tuners. Um, Tim also has a fabulous book out on the topic. I'll let Tim mention that. But Tim, if you would, please take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, welcome, everybody. I just already welcomed you. I'd like to welcome you personally. I'm going to go through my part of the presentation at super speed, and I'm going to dive right in. Now, Jeff set the stage by saying, talking about the importance of trust and also about how you can lose trust before someone even gets to your site. Of course, our company, Site Tuners, is focused all about the on-site experience on websites and mobile. Uh, just by way of background, we've helped both large and small companies uh, redesign their websites for higher conversion, come up with test plans, train them internally to be more effective in conversion rate optimization. Uh, so that's kind of the perspective we're coming from. And I have to say, building trust online is actually very, very difficult uh, because there are two key problems with it. One is that you have to do it quickly. Uh, the visual first impression that people build of your site happens in 50 milliseconds. So you like it or you don't, we're going to judge a book by its cover and we get this instant first impression of your site. But the harder thing is it happens anonymously. What I mean by that is that we don't really have a face-to-face -face relationship. We have a face-to-screen relationship. And consequently, you don't know your visitors. What do you really know about them? Well, maybe you know a few um, 
settings in their browser, their screen resolution, what operating system they're using, but you don't know their temperament or uh, what they had for breakfast or whether they had a fight uh, with their kids that morning. You don't know any of the important stuff about their buying style, their belief systems. And so no, there's not much you can really do about that. But you can fix this part. As, as Jeff said in his points 9 and 10, it's about what you can do to externalize trust and build trust and, and change this part of the equation, which is that they don't know you. So I'm going to talk very quickly about the four pillars of building tr instant trust online. And the first of these we've already touched on is, of course, appearance. I mean, this guy looks pretty presentable, I have to say. And, you know, as a guy, I can say, damn, he's too handsome. But that's, that's a separate story. The point is we're going to judge people by appearance. And so one quick way to blow trust is to have a really cheesy appearance. This website spends hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, I'm not kidding, on Google AdWords, pay-per-click, to drive traffic to their homepage, to sell grand pianos, folks. And look at this website. It's just a you know, flashback to 1995, just shortly before after Al Gore invented the interwebs, and they expect you to buy $25,000 grand pianos with this site. Not going to happen. I live in San Diego, which is a bit of a boaty town, and um, this company here sells high-end yachts. You wouldn't know it from their site, although they have a fantastic feature. You can't really get the full effect here, but that American flag in the middle of the page actually is animated and waves. Oh yeah, that's classy stuff. And then there's of course that screenshot of San Diego or photograph of San Diego Bay in tiny thumbnail size uh, near the lower right. So. Not sure what that has to do with shelling out six or seven figures for a yacht, but I'm not going to buy it here. But you know, it's not high-end luxury products like pianos and uh, like yachts that, that matter. Would you buy barbells from these folks? I mean, barbells is not necessarily gym equipment; is not that expensive. Uh, workout bench, perhaps? No way. I mean, this is a horrible site, and the first impression makes you want to probably throw up or at least hit the back button at a minimum, and. Uh, there, again, you're not getting the full effect here because in the middle of the page, that little yellow reverse text driving directions is blinking just in case you really need to go to their, to their store this second. So ways to blow trust, very easy. Ways not to do it, here's how not to do it. Don't get, get disqualified based on how you look. There's no excuse anymore for unprofessional website designs, but more than that, you don't want to be a hoarder and stuff every piece of available real estate with something. There's got to be a certain sparseness and neatness to it, room to breathe on the page, white space to isolate things and uh, ways to visually focus people. And that goes back to your mental thought process when designing your page or your website. And you have to really think in terms of organization and clarity. A lot of times the problem is your thought process and that ends up looking like a jumbled and unprofessional site. All right, let's continue on to the second pillar of trust, I call it, which is transactional assurances. And, and Jeff's spoken extensively about that, but I just want to put it in its proper context. Uh, one of the things we look for is badges when we get to a site. They're very powerful. So this is a, a screenshot, or actually, of, not a screenshot, but of, of the whole page at smartbargains.com, which is an e-commerce site. And look at the wonderful trust symbols we have at the bottom of the page. VeriSign, which is now exactly, this is an older screenshot, which is what uh, you know, Norton Secure is, uh, or what the, and UPS, they, you can pay by Visa, they're members of the Better Business Bureau Online Reliability Program. I mean, this is wonderful stuff. So what's the problem? Well, it's at the bottom of the page, where almost no one is going to see it. On a page like this, typically only 15% of people will scroll down to the bottom. So let me put that to you another way. 85% of people will never see your trust symbols. So they're not doing you any good. And like Jeff said, you have to externalize them. You have to make them visible. I'm not saying you take that whole rainbow of, of trust symbols and stick them in your header or something, but one or two selective, important, powerful ones that you know are going to influence people should definitely be above the fold. Uh, now, this is another example. It's again an older trust seal, hacker safe, but on the PetSmart site, HackerSafe seal is, was actually for a while in place of their logo in the very customary upper left portion of the page. Now they compensated for that by 
putting their logo in the middle and making a jumbo size, but you instantly get this two-part message, which is that we're safe to shop with, we're PetSmart. They're putting the trust, uh, the transactional trust above their brand. That's a pretty strong statement. Now, they've, they've since you know, changed it back to a more conventional layout, but that's a pretty strong statement. And so, so uh, do you have to have all the trust symbols? No, but the important ones, yes. And more importantly, in context, at the point of transaction or interaction. So here's an example, Helmet City. This is one of our clients, and they sell, obviously, motorcycle helmets and other kinds of helmets as well. And you, again, you can see the VeriSign. If this was a more recent screenshot, it would now be the, the Norton Secure Seal, uh, McAfee Secure as well, and the Buy Safe, Safe Shopping Seal, which is also gives you price protection and identity theft protection guarantees. And you see how that, that one happens to be in a corner wedge that always stays on the screen uh, and is pinned to the page. But you see how right there when you're thinking about buying it, you get that kind of triple whammy of trust um, when you're thinking of hitting that at the cart button. Very, very powerful and especially important in context, folks, at the point of, of interaction where your actual call to action trigger is. All right, so just to summarize about trust symbols, um, when you're thinking about transactional trust, remember that people have already gone through the sales funnel. They've become aware of you. They've become interested in your products. They've built up a desire for your products or services, and they're ready to act. This is a critical couple of minutes, maybe, that you have there. And at that point of action, you need to relieve anxiety before it arises. Tell them ahead of time about forms of payment, delivery times and options, data security and privacy, return policies and other ways for them to kind of mitigate the risk of interacting with you. This doesn't just apply to e-commerce. It's the same thing if I'm downloading a white paper. I, I, I want to know that I'm not going to get daily spam from you from then on or have your sales rep trying to hound me. Very important as well. All right, let's talk next about the third pillar of trust, which is authority. Uh, do you trust this guy? Okay, let me give you a scenario. Imagine you walked into a hospital, you have a, a, an appendix that's about to rupture. This guy walks into the room and says, hi, I'm Dr. Smith. I'll be performing your appendectomy today. Well, most of you, if you're like a, the, the live presentations that I've done this in, would probably say, yeah, I trust that guy. You know, he looks sane and you know, reasonably clean and all of that and handsome to boot. But you know what? I wouldn't trust him because he's not a real doctor. That's a stock photography image of models dressed up as doctors and nurses. But even the garb of a doctor, even that stethoscope around, excuse me, stethoscope around his neck is enough to make you trust them uh, and to comply with their wishes often. So here's another example. Uh, if this lady tells you to do something, you'll do it because she's wearing judge's robes. You see her in the uh, aisle at Walmart, not so much. Same lady. Different context, different trust dress. Uh, if this gentleman pulled you over and demanded to see your license, I'm sure you'd give it to him. Don't mess around with, with the local sheriff. And uh, now those are obviously more extreme examples of authority, but the point is that authority can also be very powerful influence on web experiences and building trust. We ran a test for Real Age, uh, which publishes the real age quiz, they can basically tell you how well you've maintained your body, so your biological as opposed to your chronological age. And they ask for very personal information on their health questionnaire. Um, do you smoke? Uh, do, you, do you drink? Uh, how do you exercise? Things that most of us wouldn't want to give up voluntarily, but we added trust seals in the form of all the media mentions that they've gotten, and that resulted in 40% more people completing the quiz. So just putting those badges in a visible place. Now, this isn't just work in business to consumer or lead generation. Uh, it also works in business to business. And in business to business, it's all about covering your butt. That's how business to business decisions get made. So we have one of our clients here, SF Video. They do large scale DVD and Blu ray duplication. And they were able to increase their conversion rate by 58% by taking this instant quote page, which they're using as a pay-per-click landing page, and adding a bunch of trust symbols to it in the form of client logos, marquee clients. If you go to SiteTuner's homepage, you're going to see our marquee clients, because in business to business, that's very important. Now, um, you might think this is overkill. Some of you are probably thinking, Tim, you just wallpapered that whole page with client logos. Well, we tested it with or 
without are actually reducing it down to six logos, the most powerful ones. And what we found is actually if you reduce this down to six, you lose the full 58% increase. That's right. More trust is better when you're talking about client logos. Now, how you present them on the page is important, whether they're full color, how big they are, whether they're clickable, all of that matters. But trust is important in the form of badges. Another form of uh, trust, this is a lead generation site for debt negotiation companies. It has to do with uh, this kind of where you're putting the trust skills on the page. I've already talked about this, but my point here is that they don't even have to be recognized trust seals. Here's their original page, and you can see some of the trust seals near the bottom. Here's our redesigned page that we did after testing a couple of million versions of this. And you can see we put the trust much more prominently along the right-hand side. Now, here's my point. If you're a consumer and you have consumer debt, you probably have never heard of DNB or Cal Chamber or USOBA or NetCheck or TASC, whatever those seals are on the right. It's just the butterfly collection, as I call it. It could be a pretty moth, but if you put it under glass with a little pin and, and label it, and people go, ooh, shiny, pretty thing, it just shows that you care enough and you're proud enough of being a good corporate citizen uh, that you're willing to put those trust seals out there. So they're not transactional trust seals, they're seals of authority saying we're part of industry organizations, that we do business um, ethically, and, and so on. Uh, let me show you this another form of trust, which is for consumers, but using well-known organizations. Now, this is one of our clients out of San Francisco, Credo Mobile, and this was a landing page to get someone to sign up for their plan, switch phone carriers, get this phone, which was state-of-the-art at the time. And this page you know, doesn't really carry the big message, though, that these guys are all about giving money, a percentage of their profits to progressive causes. So we redesigned this page after looking at all the problems with it and came up with this one. And on the right, we very carefully added the logos of the companies and organizations that they give money to. Now, you probably never heard of Credo Mobile before today, but I'm sure you've heard of Greenpeace and Planned Parenthood and Doctors Without Borders. And we did this very deliberately. I'm going to show you a heat map. This is one of our um, attention wizard heat maps of the original page. We're predicting where someone's going to look during the first few seconds. And as you can see here, the, uh, for the original page, the attention scattered all over. Uh, on the new page, we very carefully balance things. So you'd look at the phone, you'd look at the call to action button, but also by making that Greenpeace logo a little darker and bigger, that your eye would go over to the right and notice those trust symbols. We very carefully fine-tuned and balanced it. And you may say, eh, so what? And I would say, so that. So 84% more people took the offer when we did this in the, in the split test. Trust matters. Trust in the form of outside authority, media mentions, client logos, uh, certifying organizations that you're part of, all of that really matters. So basically, steal trust or borrow trust from better known brands. Reviews and awards, marquee clients, trade associations, all of that can be used to bolster your credibility. I don't know you, but as Jeff said, by the transitive property of trust, I'm going to extend trust to you through these other organizations. All right, I have one final pillar of trust I want to talk about, and that is the behavior of our peers. Now, most of you know that if you have teenagers especially that uh, we only listen to our peer group. Do you think these folks right here care too much about what you think? Uh, I would venture to guess not unless you also roll with the, whatever, 17th Street trays, or I don't know who these guys are. but Actually, red and blue bandanas, I'm pretty sure that was a posed photo because those are rival gangs normally. Anyway, my point is that we only trust people like us, we, or rather we trust more people like us. So there's several ways to incorporate this into a web experience. REI does a great job of this. As you can see here, if I'm thinking of buying this backpack, what I care about, as you can see there in the product ratings and everything else, is 84 people have, re have reviewed it. That means they bought it. That means they're a peer. I, can't, I, I might not love my wife, but I don't care about her opinion of backpacks. On the other hand, people that have bought that backpack, I care very much about in this context. 90 likes on Facebook, that's telling me about its popularity as well. Those are things that I want to know. And this can sometimes appears multiple ways on a page. For example, I was listening to Pandora Internet Radio a while ago, 
And on the left, it had the Google Side Wiki, which allows anyone with the Google ID to leave comments on a website uh, about whether they like it or not. It's a permanent record of the people that visited that site. And it always, if you have it open, modifies your experience with social context. And uh, similarly, at the top of the page, once I logged in, it said, hey, we're, we're using Facebook to personalize your experience. Are you OK with that? And I tend to say yes to things like this because it's uh, something that I don't have any expectation of, or let me say it a different way, I don't have any illusions about internet privacy. So um, I said, okay, let's do it. So there I am listening to internet radio on Pandora, and Lenny Kravitz comes on and says, once you dig in, and good song. Um, that's not the point either. But down below in the lower left, it said, one of my friends on Facebook likes this artist. Now, what does Pandora want me to do? What's their call to action? What's their conversion? Well, it's either buy it for a couple of bucks for the track or give it a thumbs up or down to improve their recommendation engine. And they found that a lot more people do that when they provide the social context because we feel more comfortable commenting on that particular song or buying that particular song when we know we're not alone in liking it. Uh, here's a very powerful way of deploying social proof. A long time ago, I downloaded the latest version of Firefox, and I, and I was poking around the page, and I noticed this, a couple of very powerful um, kinds of trust indicators. This was six weeks after this version launched. Half a billion, yes, folks, that's billion with a B, half a billion downloads of this browser. So if you're thinking about downloading it, uh, I don't think you'd have second doubts if, if you saw this. Also, they had an interactive map, as you can see on the left, and I happened to be in Germany at the time, so all over Central Europe, these little blinking dots are going on and off with people downloading it as we speak. So I'm thinking, wow, other internet users all around me here in Central Europe are downloading Firefox right now, and half a billion have done it already. Do you see the power of that kind of double whammy? Very, very strong. So basically, this is all building on the fantastic work of Dr. Robert Cialdini. If you haven't read his book, Influence, uh, you're missing out. Uh, but he talks about social proof. And to get someone to comply with your wishes, or to, in this case, convert, you can demonstrate social proof by showing objective large numbers. Half a billion people have done this. That's definitely a shortcut to my decision making and showing me people that are similar. So a lot of times if you have even niche products, what you want to do instead of having generic testimonials on your kind of product detail pages, you can have stuff related to that specific product or service. And we'll use that again on the SiteTuner site. If you go to any of our services, you'll see testimonials of people using that particular service, which says they're people just like you who were also at one point considering using that service. All right, well, uh, just uh, want to let you know it's very easy to get a hold of me. That we will be sending you this deck. My contact information is there. I welcome you to connect on Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, if you're interested in learning a lot about this, pick up a copy of the second edition of the landing page optimization book that I co-authored with Rich Page and Maura Ginty. Try out our Attention Wizard software for yourself to help you focus visually on the right parts of your page. And um, if you want us to take a quick look at your site, go to express-review.com. We'll do an interactive 45 or 90 minute review. We'll give you the video recording. And if you mention trust after you order, you'll get $100 off. Um, we also have our, our fourth year now of the International Conversion Conference Series. And I would invite you to check out our Boston show coming up here September 30th, October 1st. It's not too late and you get a $200 off the registration if you use the promo code HANDSHAKE. And so we hope to see you all there. I think at this point we're going to open it up to Q&A and Casey uh, Murphy, our wonderful director of marketing, will field some questions and direct them to Jeff and me. And uh, we look forward to interacting with you. Well, guys, I tell you what, you must have done a very thorough job because I'm not seeing a lot of questions come in through the pane. So attendees, if you've got questions that you would like to get answered, please use your question panel. We'll be watching for them to come through. In the meantime, you guys can talk amongst yourselves. Okay, <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> any, any thoughts? Uh, you know, you know, we've done both presentations. Any, any other comments you want to make? Absolutely so. You, you bring up a good point there about 
about balance in, in, in trust mark design and trust mark, mark placement. You know, show them, don't show them below the fold. Where should they go? When should they appear in the whole process? When, they, when you establish, when you land on the site at the moment of truth, you know, there's all sorts of things that site trainers certainly could recommend about that. And obviously there's, 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 there's polls to that too. When is enough and those things that, that you can test. One thing that I've seen is, is um, there, there tends to, you, you tend to start knowing that you're overdoing it on the trust marks, whether it be the circle check mark from us or Better Business Bureau or the trustee for privacy or the credit card statements or that you belong to these organizations when your site starts to look like a NASCAR vehicle. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. You don't, you don't want to use all <laughs> trust symbols all over the place. All right, look, we we do have uh, looks like some quick questions coming in. Uh, Ed asks, what's the highest ranking trust factor? It really depends on your audience. One thing that there's some interesting um, testing from some folks in the Netherlands um, that says you might not want to deploy all of your trust symbols at once. You might just want to use testimonials or just third-party endorsements in the form of seals or transactional trust, maybe not all of them together because what you get is a kind of averaging effect. And what they've shown is that the leading one for a particular context really depends on your audience. Absolutely. Okay. Deploy them based on what you want to accomplish. You want them to trust the site, tell them the trust is good. Do you want, to, you want them to, to feel good about the, or entering their credit card? That's going to tell you something different. Do you want them do you want them to recommend your product or increase for increase for you increase awareness or sales of that product? That's a good time for a social media share. Okay, um, now we have some, and this may be a little bit out of our comfort zone, but uh, let's see. Can you address the concept of people coming to the site that have a problem in their mind? Greg's asking this, uh, which they want a solution to. Well, absolutely, your whole site should be designed with kind of a task-based or intent-based orientation, what we call user scenarios. Um, but trust underlies all, all of that. If they don't feel safe there, uh, or if they're trying to consider a very expensive purchase, nothing's going to happen without the trust. So it's kind of the, the foundational stuff, I would say. Anything you want to add to that, Jeff? I think you, have, you nailed that one. Okay, this one's uh, for you. Can you provide a few examples of trust issues specific to B2B and some tools uh, to build trust for large corporate buyers that are uh, likely to be by offline ultimately with a purchase order? Any thoughts about that, Jeff? Yeah, we, we, a lot of the same trust tools apply that we've seen, um, specifically as they would apply to security since that's our gig. However, we've also seen a lot of the, the referential trust indicator. That is, the quote of some business increased blah, 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 a meaningful statistic. They've, uh, they've decreased downtime by blah, 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 blah. Their engines fall off planes this less likely. Or a quote, our customer uh, so-and-so in the Netherlands has, has profited by this. See yeah. our case study. So anything yeah, and that you can quote Case these studies sets, are, right? are very powerful, and I would say also for business to business, we're, you need to have case studies in all the major verticals you serve. Yes. In other words, uh, if, if I'm a bank and, uh, and you are a, uh, a consumer retailer, I don't think my experience is relevant to your industry. So you really, it's better to have one or two hand-picked case studies in every vertical than it is to just have generic case studies. You got it. And then the one other thing I'd say is that the, the calls to action are different. A lot of times earlier in the longer processes, you want to have downloads or get an email address. And all of your stuff, all of your touch points should be clean. All the downloads should be very professionally formatted and so on. Um, that's the only tangible manifestation they have of you. Uh, okay, let's see. Greg's asking if uh, color and graphics play into trust based on industry or products. Uh, Jeff, have you seen anything with the uh, placement or position or color of trust seals or anything like that? The, there, there's usually not a lot of choice. Maybe you get a couple different sizes or orientations. The placement, I think, is key. And, and really, our, our overriding recommendation is place it near what you want them to do. Even if it's think about you in a different way, get that, that's the key to placement. Yeah, and uh, let's see, Jim asks, is asking about email. I think this may be a little outside of our scope. Uh, 
he's doing email marketing and sending people to his site, but he, his domain was blacklisted. Does that affect SEO and conversion? Well, not directly, but you're just going to see a lot fewer people if they're not showing up on your site. So you better get that dealt with, uh, however you're going to do that. Um, Eric asks, and I mentioned that 15% of users will scroll to the bottom of the page. Does this correlate with the overall height of the page? Uh, no, it's just even longer pages. There's just scrollers and non-scrollers. Now, this is research for the web, and it has increased from about 5 to 15% because a lot of us have those little scrolly wheels in our mice. It's very different for tablets and for smartphones. There's an expectation of vertical scrolling. You can't fit everything on tiny screens. So having your thumbs and being able to speed along on a phone or a tablet is much more acceptable. So that doesn't necessarily apply to mobile or tablets. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see if they, we have any other questions. I think we we've uh, hit most of them. Let me let me go up here a little bit. Um, most of the questions I saw. When as you well. talk about identity, do you yeah yeah when do you, when you talk about identity, do you refer to EV certificates? I'm not sure. I uh, I'm familiar with the acronym EV. Absolutely. Jeffrey. Yeah, so a couple different things there. It, it all centers on, on what is validated about the person or the organization applying for the certificate, and therefore what steps are taken to validate that that, that, that that certificate belongs to the company that bought it, www.coke.com. Did Coca-Cola actually apply for and get that certificate, and what steps did the certificate authority go through to validate it? it that it that that's really Coke. The one that you're referring to that you mentioned, EV, is the one that turns the address bar in the browser browser green. It's the only SSL certificate do, that, that does that, and that specifically has been has been proven to show uplift in conversions, reduce co shopping cart abandonment, so on and so forth. Okay. Well, actually, we had people ask, and you mentioned a range. If you could repeat it. So when you're talking about transactional trust, like Norton Secure, what kind of lifts? Do you see, and which kind of companies benefit the most from that? I would expect the big brand doesn't really need too much trust building. So uh, can you comment on that percentage improvement and where it's most effective? Yeah, you'd be surprised. Um, so you, you, go, you go to a, a brand that's well known, like PayPal, okay, moving money, having a lot of identity stuff, and they don't show security seals until that moment of truth where you log in or you're ready to pay. And then, boom, there's a seal right there that says trust trusted site. Okay. So the application of the site uh, of the seal really is more about the user experience than it is about the leverage of the brand. We're finding, I'll put it delicately, a major computer brand located in Cupertino, California. That's weighing the <laughs> same thing. Same experience. So it it's it it has little to do with, with what you're trying to accomplish on your site. There's some variances there with banking and e-commerce and what have you, but it's more about becoming more and more about what the user expense and how experiences and how they're prompted along through the experience. All right. Well, I think uh, we're coming to the end of our time, unfortunately. Um, you know, Jeff, thanks for co-presenting. Uh, hopefully, folks, you, you got something out of it. Again, you will be getting a follow-up email with both the slide decks as well as uh, the uh, recording of the, of the whole webinar to pass along to your colleagues and friends. And we hope to see you on the flip side.